Not everything that is, that is accounted or we have an account of in Acts is done correctly. Right? That's obvious. Human beings do things wrong. They make mistakes. There is a point at which Paul goes to the temple to make a sacrifice after he's been saved, after he's planted a bunch of churches. He circumcises Timothy after saying, circumcision availeth nothing. That's the man who wrote that. And then he circumcises Timothy, and he takes him to the temple to do a sacrifice. This is also the man who wrote, there is now therefore no more sacrifice for sin. Clearly, he was making a mistake. God put a stop to it. He never did make a sacrifice. He got attacked by a mob before he could get that done. Okay, but so realize just because something happens in the book of Acts doesn't mean that that's what God wanted to have happen. I think some people think of the book of Acts like they think of Romans or 1st or 2nd Corinthians where the doctrine being taught is perfect because it comes straight from the Holy Ghost and it's being taught as doctrine. The book of Acts is a book of history much like books in the Old Testament. And just because God's people do something, that doesn't mean it's right. Everyone understand? Okay, so we're in the book of Acts here. We're at the end of chapter 5. Um, this is where the Sanhedrin, this is the second time they've confronted the disciples about preaching in, in the name of Jesus, and they have them beaten. Um, in verse 40, And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Of course, they were not going to follow that order. They've already said they're not going to follow that order, right? But <clears throat> nevertheless, they were ordered and beaten. And we read over that like it's no big deal. But my belief is that that was a very unpleasant experience, okay, uh, with a great deal of physical pain. They departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame in his name. Look at verse 42, and daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So they continued to gather at the temple and they went in every house. Now this is why this is one of the reasons we go door to door is this passage here. In every house. We, we go out to reach people. Okay, that's what missionaries do. Um, every Christian is supposed to be a missionary. Now it is true that we have the office that we call a missionary. Um, really, that office in Scripture is an evangelist. Okay? What the Bible calls an evangelist, we would call a missionary. That's the person you send out with the gospel to reach lost people and plant churches. That's the work of an evangelist. What we in our culture call evangelists, the traveling preachers that go from church to church and try to stir up revivals and things, that office doesn't exist in Scripture. That's just something we do. It's not a biblical office. Everyone understand what I'm saying? Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it, but he's not a biblical evangelist. Those are missionaries, okay? And we're gonna look as we go through this, the reason we're going through the book of Acts carefully and then we're gonna move through this dispensation is because this is the dispensation in which we live, right? And so the rules for worship and obedience to God in this dispensation are the ones we need to care deeply about because they're the ones we need to follow. And so now we start chapter 6, and it says the first deacons. For most people, that you'll have a, uh, some sort of title there on the chapter, first deacons. And so <clears throat> it tells us, of course, we know the story, but in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Now, the Grecians here are not Greeks. They're not Gentiles. They are Hebrews who speak Greek as their language. You want to understand what I'm saying? They're, the, they're Greek-speaking Jews, like Luke. Okay? And in fact, if you look at the names of the, de the deacons chosen, at least two of them are clearly the same thing. Timothy was that. He was a Greek-speaking Jew. Okay? And if you look on here, when they pick their... their uh, their uh, deacons here in verse 5, you see Philip um, and Prochorus. Both of those are Greeks. Those are Greek names. And so some of the people they picked were people from among that group that were bothered 
by what was happening. And so this had to do with a language issue, not a race or a, an ethnicity, okay, or even a, a religious background. They had not yet reached out to Gentiles. We'll see that in a few chapters. But there's this issue in the church, and that is that the Greek-speaking Hebrew, or the Greek-speaking women that were widows were not receiving from the church the kind of support, monetary support, because that's what it's about, food and things like that, as the Hebrew-speaking widows were receiving. Well, that caused a problem. They said a murmuring arose. Now, do, what do we know about the Lord and murmuring? Does he like it? No, he hates it, right? He's very clear he hates it, all through Scripture, in every dispensation. He does not like a bad attitude. All of us that have raised kids, of course, we know that children develop bad attitudes at various times, and you try to convince them to change their attitude, right? You can't, because that's something they do internally, but you can put pressure on them to do it, right? And, and that's what we try to do. Why do we do that? Well, because even if they are right about a fact that is frustrating them, their attitude will not help anybody. A bad attitude will not fix that fact. It also uh, will not help you with anything else you must do. God likes cheerful people. He likes people who are thankful. He likes people who are humble and meek and lowly. Murmuring is a result of a bad attitude. And so this is a problem in the church. So then it says in verse 2, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason. In other words, it doesn't make any sense. That's what that means. It's not reason. It's not sensible. That we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So these are the leaders of the church. The murmuring reaches them. They gather everyone and they say, Hey, this is not a problem we should be dealing with. Okay? It's our business to concentrate on doctrine. Okay, we need someone else to handle the physical matters, the monetary matters, the physical stuff that goes on in the church, who we can trust to do it right. Okay? Um, our business is to concentrate on doctrine, the Word of God, understanding it and teaching it. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word." And so you see a division between offices here. The apostles, of course, they had their own office, um, the office of an apostle, which was an office that did exist in the book of Acts in the early church, and they, they laid the foundation of churches by writing the New Testament and by establishing churches and doing it a certain way that we then have followed ever since. Okay. Uh, but the apostles also were pastors, right? And so in, in churches today, we have two, there are two biblical offices. And then there's the evangelist, who is not a church office, but comes out from a church, okay? And those two biblical offices are pastors and deacons. The pastors are also bishops, also called elders. There are three different terms used for them in the New Testament. We know it's referring to the same office because there's two verses, and I think it's 1 Peter, it might be 2 Peter, but there's two verses in which all three are used to refer to the same person, the same office. Okay? And so an elder, a bishop, and a pastor are the same thing. A bishop, that just simply means shepherd. That's, that's what it means. I mean, it, it, you know, it's about, you know, rounding people up with authority. Okay? And so that's one office in a church. The other is the deacon. And we know this office exists because, of course, later on in, in Timothy, we, we're given instructions about both the office of an elder and the office of a deacon, about who they have to be and what requirements they have to meet to fill those offices. These are the first set of deacons. And what is a deacon's job? It is to manage the physical and monetary matters of the church under the authority of the bishop or the pastor. Right? So it's not the pastor's business to be cleaning the church. Some pastors have to do it because they don't have anyone else to do it. It's not the pastor's business to even be coordinating the mowing and the cleaning and all that. We should have a deacon that does that. 
That should be a deacon's business. He takes that problem off of the pastor's plate because it is not reason that the pastor should be worried about this nonsense when he needs to be focused on ministering the Word of God. Everyone understand? So deacons are not little pastors. They have an entirely different job. And they have no authority within the church except to carry out the physical and monetary uh, responsibilities that the pastor has given them. And that's it. And so you'll run into some churches where the deacon's board runs the church. Well, that's unbiblical. Do you think these seven men got together to tell the apostles how things should be done in the church in Jerusalem? Or to correct his doctrine? Yeah, I guarantee you that did not happen. These were men who carried out their job which was to make sure that the ministrations to the widows were done equally and fairly. That was it. That, that was the problem that gave rise to them. And so that's what they do. Now it says in verse 6, well, it tells us in, the five, in verse 5 who they are. And it says, verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Now what does that have to do with? Well, that's ordination. Okay? Um, and we do that now. No person should be a pastor or a deacon in any church who's not been ordained. Okay, no one gets to choose for themselves, I'm a pastor. No one gets to say, look, God's called me to be a pastor. I know no one else on earth believes it, but God called me to be a pastor. Well, if God called you to be a pastor, you'd be ordained. Why would you be ordained? Because God has men that listen to him. And he has instructed them to ordain people he's called to be pastor. And if you can't find a group of honest, Bible-believing pastors who, know, who agree with you that you're, you've been called, well, then you haven't been. You just think you have. Everyone understand? God doesn't do things willy-nilly. He does things decently and in order and under authority. That's how he operates. And he establishes human authorities to do this. So... If you're going to be an evangelist or missionary, if you're going to be a pastor, if you're going to be a deacon, you, you've got to be ordained. You have to have demonstrated to the satisfaction of a group of godly men that you really are called to do this job. And so we, as a church, could never call to be a pastor a man who has not been ordained. Right? That, that would just be unbiblical. We just can't, we can't do that. We have to have ordination. But that's what's going on here. It's ordination. Okay? Now... In another passage, uh, Paul tells Timothy to stir up, or Titus maybe, I can't remember which one, tells him to stir up the gift that is in them through the laying on of hands. And when you read that, Charismatics will tell you he's talking there about sign gifts. Well, I don't think he is. I mean, it's possible. I don't want to, the clause is not clear, right? It could mean various things. It is possible that, that that is what Paul was referring to. However, it doesn't make sense that that's what he's referring to. What he's saying, I believe, given the context of the passage, because he's telling him about preaching the word and staying firm in it and so on, he's talking about his ordination. He's saying, you were appointed to be the pastor. So do your work. The gift that's in you if you're, as a pastor is to study the word of God and teach and preach it. And those are the instructions that follow that, that he gives Timothy. So that's really what he's talking about. He's telling him to get focused on the Word of God and learn it as best he can and teach it fully, right? Cover to cover. So um, I don't believe it has anything to do with sign gift powers. It has to do rather with the gift that's put in a man who's ordained to, be, to carry the office that he's been given. In, in a later passage, we're told that God gifted to the church apostles, right, um, and prophets, and pastors and teachers. Those are gifts from God to the church. Okay, and so that's really a pastor's job, is to control the doctrine in the church, the teaching and the preaching. So all of my lessons are under the authority of Pastor Hensley. He, he watches them all. He knows everything that's said. And if something is said that's unbiblical, it's his business to notice it and correct it. 
both directly with me and then to the church to make sure there's no confusion about what we believe as a church. I'm human, I'll make mistakes. I'll say things wrong, right? And other people do too, no doubt about it. I mean, if we brought in a, a traveling preacher and he gets up there and starts talking about sign gifts, well, that, that message is going to cut off. I could have finished that, that message, right? Out of the pulpit. Why? Because Pastor Hensley has a responsibility to protect the doctrinal purity of this church. And you can't put a man in the pulpit who's teaching heresy. I watched Pastor Starr chase a man right out of the pulpit in Boston. Got right out of his chair. He was sitting in the front row. Got right out of his chair, jumped up onto the, onto the podium, and pushed him out from behind the pulpit. Physically. He said, go sit down. Because he was teaching heresy. He was a Ruckmanite. We didn't know that. Somehow he slipped past our defenses. <laughs> and he was teaching that you got saved different ways in different dispensations. That under the law, you had to both keep the law and have faith. That in the kingdom age, you'll only get saved by keeping the law perfectly. Well, that's utter nonsense. That's not biblical at all. That's heresy, and that's bad heresy. And so he was getting into that, and when Pastor Starr, when it triggered in his mind what was being said, he put a stop to it instantly. And then he corrected it. He spent the next 10 minutes explaining why that was wrong from the pulpit, he made the guy sit there and listen. So a pastor's job is to protect the doctrine, okay? Not to worry about all the physical things. Now in our church, we're small. We don't yet have deacons. We don't have people that are prepared for that. Uh, that may happen hopefully pretty soon, but uh, we don't. So Pastor Hensley has to waste some of his time on these things that he shouldn't have to waste his time on. Now here's what I would say about that is for us as church members. There are two types of deacons. What does the word deacon mean? Servant. That's exactly right. That's what it means. And that's all it means. Servant. Not Lord. Okay. Not master. Servant. There's an office of the deacon. And then there's also just deacons. People who are servants. Right? They don't hold the office. But they carry out things that need to be done. Because they're honest, godly servants of the church. Similar to the apostles, there's the office of the apostle. The word just means a sent one, a witness or a, an ambassador of, of sorts. Someone you send out to carry a message. That's all apostle means. There's the office of the apostle. There were 12 or 13 of those. And then there are other people who are even called in the Bible apostles. Okay, They didn't have the office, but they were sent out by the church to carry out a particular task. They were an apostle of the church not the office of apostle. Everyone understand the difference? Because heretics will insist that every time a word is used, it means the same thing everywhere. Okay? Because they do that, they get themselves all confused about what's being referred to in a particular passage. But no one speaks that way. We do not use one word to mean one thing and one thing only. Never have and we never will. Use the word pray. Of course, in this context, whenever we talk about praying, we all think about praying to God. But you know, you can pray to the judge not to judge you so harshly for your DWP, right? You can go to your lawyer and, and pray that he'll help you. It just means you're asking him. They're not the same thing. Does everyone understand? So we use these words in different settings and for different concepts all the time. And so my point on that is this. We don't have the office of deacon yet in this church. We're not prepared for it. But we have people in here who could do the work. Can't hold the office necessarily, but you can do the work. You can be a deacon. And if you're one of those people willing to do some of these things, well, volunteer. Go to the pastor and tell him, look, I want to help you. I, I, you know, you shouldn't have to worry about how the church gets cleaned. You shouldn't have to worry about how the lawn gets mowed. Um, I want to help you with that. So, will you let me? And then he'll decide. He may say, no, I've got a plan. Or someone else has already volunteered. Don't get offended. Okay? Just be ready to help. 
and, and take some of that weight off of him so he can concentrate on building the actual ministry here with the doctrinal foundation it needs to do the work in Emmett and the surrounding towns that we're trying to do. Okay? So that's what deacons are. They're servants in the church. They're not leaders. They're not in charge. They're servants. And they serve the entire church body. And they do it by managing the, the material aspects of church operations. Okay? Keeping things clean, uh, managing the money, making sure that the proper tracks are purchased and in where they need to be, uh, Bibles for guests are available, all these physical, you know, the things that have to be done for a church to operate smoothly, making sure the bills get paid, the heat's on, <laughs> the air conditioning's on, whatever you need, the electronic system works, those are all the work of a deacon. The pastor shouldn't be even noticing this stuff. He should just walk in, put on his mic, and work. Because his focus should be entirely on this book and, and then communicating it to the church members. All right, so we see these first deacons, and then it gets into uh, this issue with Stephen. We're not going to go through this whole thing. Everyone knows the story of Stephen, right? He was one of the deacons, one of the men chosen. He was also, obviously, a preacher and teacher. Just because you're a deacon doesn't mean you can't be a preacher. Preacher and pastor are not the same thing. All pastors are preachers and teachers, but not all preachers and teachers are pastors right? Preaching and teaching is something you do. Pastoring is an office. And no one is qualified to be a pastor who can't preach and can't teach. Those are requirements. There are people who think they're called to be a pastor. Oh, but man, you just, you can't get anything out of what they're saying, right? Well, you're not. You're not qualified. You've got to be able to preach a clear message and you've got to be able to teach effectively or you're not a pastor. There are actual requirements. All right, so, but just because you're not a pastor doesn't mean you can't be a preacher or teacher. You should be. We're all supposed to be teaching each other all the time. That's what the Bible says. We're all supposed to be exhorting one another regularly. And because every one of us is called to go to our neighbors with the gospel, every one of us is a preacher. Men, women, children, all of us. We are to preach to our neighbors. Okay? When we go out on visitation, what are we doing? We're doing the work of an evangelist. What do evangelists do? They proclaim the evangel, which is just the Latin word for gospel. They're gospelers. Okay? Well, that's what we do when we go door to door. And so all of us are to be preachers, and all of us should be teachers. Paul, in fact, rebukes the believers in Hebrews because he said, you ought to be teachers, and you're not. I have to teach you again the first principles. You ought to have advanced past that and be able to teach yourselves now. That's what he tells them. They stayed babies. And he says, everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the Word of God. Well, Christians aren't supposed to stay there. They're supposed to learn so that they can teach themselves, right? And, of course, some Christians are never called to teach in a, in a formal setting. That's fine. You have family members. You've got friends. You've got all kinds of people you can teach. Okay? Um, okay, so Stephen was one of those. He was a preacher and a teacher and an evangelist. He went out and preached the gospel to people. He would, clearly was going door to door and preaching on the streets. And it got people's attention. And so the Sanhedrin had him arrested, just like they did Peter and John previously. And they drag him in front of them. Um, now, they, they make a, a claim that he said, Jesus is going to destroy this place, uh, and it shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Well, that's all true. The Lord's already said in the book of Luke, this place is going to get destroyed. Not one stone left on top of another. This isn't blasphemy. This is what God said. They call it blasphemy because they don't believe God. And, of course, he's going to change the customs. It's in verse 14. Uh, and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Well, yeah, that's happening right now, actually. <laughs> right here in the book of Acts, that's already happening. 
And, and so the Sanhedrin doesn't want to hear any of that. They've got this set of rules that has given them power, and they want to hang on to their power because they're lost and undone human beings. And that's how human beings are. They're about power, control. And it goes on in chapter 7. Uh, they drag him in there. And in verse 15, at the end of chapter 6, says, and, and all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Now, I don't know what that means exactly. I think, I think it has something to do with some light coming out of him. I think God does a miracle here to capture them to the point to where they're going to hear this message whether they want to or not. And we'll see. They don't want to. Okay? But he's going to deliver a very hard message to these men. And so what does Stephen preach? Well, he goes basically through the history of Israel going back to Abraham. Now, he doesn't go through the whole thing and every event, but he goes through a lot of it. And what is, what is the burden of his message? He points out the failure of Israel's people and leaders to obey God at every turn. Right, and well, he does that at the end. He goes through piece by piece. He shows them all these events to show them their, the failure of the people over, throughout history to be obedient. And why is he doing that? He's saying, you're just like our fathers. And that's what he does at the end. He says in verse 51, when he's wrapping it up, this is the message or the lesson that they're supposed to draw from the historical events he's listed for them. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one. Of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. That's a hard message. Who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Of course, they violated it all the time. The Lord himself pointed out how they violated it. And then, of course, they violated it to have him crucified. They're violating it now to beat these men who have done nothing wrong. Okay? And so, um, he just puts it right on them. Okay, now, how many of you have ever heard someone say, well, I don't like hard preaching. I, I want to be built up and encouraged. Have you ever heard that? Okay. Of course. Right? We've all heard that. And what they call it, they say, well, that hard preaching is hellfire and brimstone. That's the term they like to use. Well, there's some of that in that. If, if you don't preach on hell, you're not an honest preacher. It's a scary book. <laughs> but we ought not to be scared of it. It has very little to do with us. Well, not only wants us to, he, he orders us to and says that you'll be blessed if you study it and know it. Right there in the first chapter. Yep. So, you know, I mean, it's like everything else. You know, some people are scared of the book of Hebrews. Some people are scared of this book or that book because they've heard heretics misuse it. Don't be scared of it. We don't have any reason to be scared of anything in Scripture. But what we do as Christians need sometimes is to have a finger pointed at us. which is exactly true. Now, keep in mind when the pastor preaches a hard sermon about something, and we don't know, you know what it might be or not be, but he's preaching about some misbehavior, some failure, and you, in your own mind, know that's me. He doesn't know that necessarily. I mean, he might, but he might not. He probably doesn't. That's not why he preaches things. He doesn't preach to address something. He preaches because God has told him to, t to deliver this particular message. That's why he spends his time in prayer and study, so that he can be sure he's got the, the message God wants him to give that day. So who really is putting their finger on your misbehavior? It's the Holy Ghost, right? That's who it is. So Pastor Starr used to say, if, if you don't like the way this is rubbing your fur, turn around. Or if I'm stepping on your toes, back up. Right? The point being, this isn't me. This is the Holy Spirit. Respond to him. What is turn around? Well, it means repent. Think if you're rubbing the cat's fur the wrong way, turn the cat around. It'll go smooth, right? 
And that's all he's saying. He's saying, if what I'm saying is a problem for you, and he didn't know, you repent, and then it won't be a problem. Right? The fur will be smooth. Everyone will be happy. <laughs> okay? Well, that's, that is the kind of preaching Christians actually do need. We need to be talked to about our behavior, about how we talk to our loved ones, about uh, what we do with our spare time, how we spend our money, the things we watch, the things we hear, the things we're involved with outside of church. All of that matters, right? It, look, I'm not, I know nothing about anybody's, but I'm not talking to anybody in particular. And as I'm talking, I myself am feeling convicted about some things. Why is that? Well, because the Holy Spirit is trying to turn people around. It's not me. <laughs> I can't turn anyone around. If I could, my kids would all be perfect. And they're not, <laughs> right? So we can't. Only the Holy Ghost can get to people's hearts. But it is the responsibility of the pastor to deliver hard messages to his church so that his church people can correct the behavior, do right, and grow in grace. That's all it's about. It's for their benefit. It's for the church's benefit. It's for everybody's benefit that they hear those messages. Now, not every message is like that. There are a lot of, of wonderful, uplifting messages. When pastor preaches on, on the crucifixion, that's uplifting, right? Should, the only conviction you should get out of that is, it's my sin that put him on the cross. And that's true. It is. But, but what you should be taking from that is, man, God loves me. What an amazing thing that he became one of us, loaded my filthy sin onto his back and died on the cross for me. Yeah. Well, we're not. There's a, there's a great multitude. But, but yes, <laughs> but it's very individual. And so, there are many times the message is not convicting, it's not a hard message, it's a, it's a good, uplifting, make you feel good message. But you can't have a church built only on that. You got, the whole counsel of God has to be preached and the whole counsel of God has to be taught and that includes rebukes and exhortations. And exhortations are, you know, a rebuke is stop what you're doing. An exhortation is correct your behavior and do right. Okay, And so those are part of what every pastor has to make sure is being delivered to his church. People who don't want to receive that don't want to be in a real church where there's real teaching and preaching. They want to be in something else, some social club they call a church, where everyone pats each other on the back and talks about how great we are. Well, we're not great. Okay, We're sinners. God loves us. And you can be a faithful follower of God. As a, as a saved sinner, but you're still a sinner. And all the good things that you do for the Lord, He's really doing it through you. It's really Him. Of course, He's thrilled that you let Him, because that's what it takes. It takes you letting go of the reins and letting God have His way and doing what He says instead of what you want to do. And that makes Him happy. He likes that. You want to please God? That's how you do it. You make God happy. Bible says you can. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. How do you please Him? Faith. What is faith? That entire chapter, it's chapter 11 of Hebrews, that entire chapter shows you what faith is. It's obediently doing what God says. So when He tells Noah, I'm going to bring a flood, everyone's going to die, you need to build an ark. Well, no floods had ever happened. In fact, from what we can tell with Scripture, it had never even rained. So what does Noah do? He says, ah, pff, come on, come on. Or, or better yet, could he say, oh, God, I do believe you. I'm terrified, but then not do anything. Uh, the firmament's just an expanse. And, you know, there's an idea that there was a, a canopy of water around the earth. I think there probably was. I don't know that for certain. But it looks that way. Um, and that dropped during the flood, as well as the fountains of the deep were broken up. So stuff come up out of the, from underneath the earth and, and from underneath the crust as well. It was a mess. But my point on this is, what, how did Noah respond? He built an ark, right? And the Bible says, moved with fear. Not only did he believe what God said, he believed it so much he knew it was absolutely true, and he acted on it. 
That's faith. You want to make God happy? Do that. Well, so when the pastor preaches a, you know, a hard sermon, uh, be, a, be a Noah. Believe what you're hearing, if it's scriptural, believe it, and make the changes in your life necessary to act successfully on what God says. And who will that please? Amazing that, it, that we can even please him. But it does. It makes him happy. He likes that. Yeah, that's a blessing. We should, we should be uh, glad we have that option. So now, Stephen gives them these, this hard lesson. And you'll notice this is all still Jewish. He's, only, he's speaking to the Sanhedrin here. He himself is a Jewish deacon from the first church in Jerusalem. And he's preaching to Jews, and he's using the Old Testament and Israel's history, specifically to convict them about their own sin and the rebellion and their refusal to repent about who Christ was and what he did for them. And in the end, of course, it leads to his death. And so then the question, you know, for a lot of Christians is, well, I don't want to get stoned to death. Is this how things end if I just stand up for God? Well, it can. I mean, I hope not. I don't want this either. But we ought not to be frightened of it. Right? What did, what did the Lord Jesus say about who to fear? Don't fear them that can only kill the body. Fear him who can kill the body and cast the body and soul together into hell. Who's he talking about? Yeah, he's talking about God, right? The devil can't touch you unless God lets him. God is the one that decides when you die. And God is the one who has the power to cast you into hell. He's the one to fear. If you fear him, you don't fear men. Because whatever they do to you, and they can do things, don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean bad things won't happen. But it's limited. All they can do is kill you in the end. I mean, they can take their time with it, which is unpleasant, okay? But in the end, the worst they can do to you is kill you. And it really doesn't kill you because you're a believer. You don't die, you just go to be with the Lord where you wait patiently for him to take vengeance. Because he's going to take vengeance. We've talked about this before. There is no wrong thing ever done that will not get righted. Now, if it got righted through Christ on the cross, well, amen, it's done. So the wrong things you've done that God would have to judge you for and, and straighten out with proper judgment, Christ took that. You don't have to worry about that. But for those people who are not saved, which is the vast majority of them out there, everything is going to get answered for. So if you've been wronged, just wait. God will take care of it. He will, one way or another. He will take care of it. That's why he says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. So he will take vengeance over what happened to Stephen. It's going to happen. But that's his business, not ours. Our business is to deliver the message. And Stephen did. And of course, they stoned him to death. And we see here Saul. He's mentioned, of course, he's there. Uh, and he's, it says he's holding the coats. What that means is he was one of the witnesses. That's what the reference is to. You couldn't stone someone under the law without two or three witnesses that would testify to what he had done wrong. Saul, or Paul, was one of the men who accused him of blasphemy. That's what that's talking about. Okay? Um, and it says, of course, and he was consenting unto his death. That means he's the, he was one of the witnesses. Do you remember the lady taken in adultery and brought to Christ. Do you remember how that ends? Was she taken in adultery? Yes, right? She was, she was definitely an adulteress. There's, no, there's literally no question about that. But the Lord didn't have her stoned. Why? He always followed the law. He never broke it. Say it louder. Right. To stone someone under the law, you had to have two or three witnesses. At the end, when he's done writing in the ground, and remember, that happened in the courtyard of the temple. Read the passage. That's where he was. He was in the courtyard of the temple. Everyone know what the courtyard of the temple, what the ground was? It wasn't dirt, in case you're wondering. It was marble blocks. And it was kept absolutely spotless at all times. So when it says he stooped down and started writing in the ground, what was he writing in with his finger? Marble. That's why they got convicted. 
he was showing them who he was. He's saying, I'm the guy that wrote the tablets on, on Sinai. That was me. That's why they all were like, whoa. And one by one, they left. Okay? And so at the end, what does he say to them? He says, or what does he say to her? Oh, what? Are there none here to accuse you or to condemn you? And she says, none, Lord. There were no witnesses. And he said, neither then do I condemn thee. But then, of course, because she was, in fact, guilty. <laughs> he then says, go forth and sin no more. Repent. Change your mind about this stuff and behave. Okay? <clears throat> so the point of that passage to us is the Lord always followed the law. Always. People will tell you, well, he broke it here or he broke it. No, he did not. He followed it perfectly to the letter every time. Okay? And they were the ones that wouldn't follow the law right. By the way, I guarantee you the Sanhedrin had that marble block torn out of there and broken up and replaced with a different one. There's no way they're going to leave that evidence laying around. I mean, you've seen everything else they've done. All right, so they kill Stephen here. Now, this is a break point, okay? And we're, this is where we're going to wrap up today. So the church so far has been entirely Jewish up to this point. And we, you're going to see now, starting in chapter 8, um, the opening of the gospel and the spreading of churches to... Uh, oh, who are those, those people in the north... Northern Israel, the half-Jews, what do they call them? Samaritans. First to the Samaritans, who, by the way, these Jews in this church in Jerusalem would not have even eaten with. Okay, It goes first to them, and then it goes to the Gentiles at Joppa, when Peter goes there to see Cornelius. And he comes back and reports to the church. God gave them the Holy Ghost just like us. Who are we to deny them? And so you can see now the shifting, the opening of the doors. That's Peter using the keys of the kingdom of heaven, okay, that he was given to open the doors to other groups of people. And you'll also see, of course, Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch was clearly Jewish in his religion, but he was no Jew. He was Ethiopian. Okay, so he was not an Israeli. He was Jewish in his faith. We don't know how that happened, but he was. And Philip leads him to a saving knowledge of Christ, and when he does go back to Ethiopia, he takes that message with him. And so we see now, from this point forward, the gospel begins to go out to others. Why does it do it? Well, this is three times in these chapters that the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem has been confronted with the truth of Jesus Christ. And three times they've rejected it, ending with the murder of Stephen, a man who had never harmed anybody, done nothing but good and they killed him. So now the message goes to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Well, now it's going to spread. And so you'll see that transition shift going forward from now on. For a few more chapters, Peter is still the focus. And then Paul becomes the focus. Because Paul is the apostle to who? The Gentiles. That's right. You know, that was hard for him. He loved Jews. More than us, I can tell you that. He says flat out in Romans that if it were up to him, he'd go to hell if it would save his brethren according to the flesh, the other Jews. He wouldn't go to hell to save me. <laughs> okay, I'm not a Jew. But he would his brethren. And, and every city he went to, he started with Jews. But that wasn't his office. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. And I believe, other than Jesus Christ himself, the greatest Christian who ever lived. I think there's no doubt about that, even though he did wrong things. From that guy, you want to talk about a sold-out, all-in, believing man putting everything he has into trying to reach people with the truth of Christ? That is Paul. And should have been, because he was a scary man. <laughs> all right, any questions? Does everyone, did everyone get some dispensational understanding of how we're shifting into this new dispensation from the law of Moses and Israel and all into this church time. Okay. All right, good. All right, you're dismissed.